Um, right, so I thought, uh, first things first, um, with, this is kind of an event to uh, get people uh, to sort of raise awareness of the uh, safe pods in the GW4 network, um, but also to kind of uh, make sure that researchers know what resources are there and how to access them and, and all that kind of stuff. And also to get some uh, insights from researchers who have been using them um, uh, to see what their experiences are like. Um, so I thought to start off, it might be useful to put a kind of a, a, a face to the names for the SafePod coordinators at Bristol, Bath and Exeter. Um, so I'm Sasha Beckles. I'm uh, one of the SafePod coordinators here at the University of Bristol. So if you have any questions about uh, accessing the UOB SafePod or uh, and, you know how to book it, uh, anything like that, please do come to me. Um, Kate, do you want to say hello? Hello, um, I'm Kate. I'm from the University of Bath and I'm one of a handful of coordinators. Thanks. I'm not sure if Chris Tibbs, the coordinator from Exeter, is here today. Yes, I'm here. Ah, Hi. Excellent. Uh, um, Hi Chris. I'm, I'm Chris Tibbs. As you said, I'm an Exeter and we have two CIPO coordinators, um, both Chris. So, yeah, just get in touch if you have <laughs> any, any questions. <laughs> Brilliant, thanks. Um, okay, so I think uh, without further ado, uh, you can hopefully see um, the, the list of what we're gonna go through in the next hour. Um, and to start off, uh, we'll have a couple of words from Darren Lightfoot of the SPN network. So Darren, uh, over to you. Thanks, Sasha. I'll just uh, share my screen, okay. Hi everyone, as Sasha said, uh, my name's Darren Leifert, I'm the SafePod Network Manager. And I'll just give you a, a short introduction to the SafePod Network. So I'll tell you a bit of information about what the SafePod Network is, how you go about registering as a researcher with us, and then how you um, go about and make SafePod bookings. So SafePod Network is a, a new research innovation um, that provides researchers with standardized safe settings that we call SafePods for data that requires secure access for research. It's part of the Administrative Data Research UK program and it's funded by the Economic and Social Research Council. Our main objectives are to remove the barriers that have existed for researchers to access data, such as those of um, cost and time to travel to dedicated safe settings. We want you to be able to um, spend more time on your research. We want to be able to provide equitable access to data for researchers across the UK. So you're never too far from, from a safe pod or a safe setting point. And we want to significantly improve the quantity and diversity of public benefit research by providing more um, safe pods for you to be able to access data. We want to improve and widen the sharing of data sets held by data centers for research. And finally, we want to be able to provide clear information and signposting for researchers to be able to understand how to access data, not just from safe pods, but from all safe settings in the UK. So this is a safe pod. It's a small room. It's about three um, square meters wide and depth, and it provides the, um, the necessary security controls for remote access to data. So here you can see there's a picture of the exterior and the interior. The exterior comes in two colors. This is the brown one. There's also a silver and gray one. And here's the, here's the inside of a safe pod as well. Um, all new safe pods come with two um, a large screen monitors. Uh, and we'll be upgrading the ones that um, uh, only have one uh, next year. So for researchers, the main features for a safe pod are as follows. So as I've just shown you, it's got the researcher area for data set analysis. There's a secure cupboard here. And that's for the storage of our, our equipment to run the safe pod. There's a CCTV camera inside. To access the safe pod, there's a door control system uh, used by swipe card. There's emergency and fire alarms. It's wheelchair accessible. We've designed it so it's really nice to work in for long periods of time. There's a high adjustable desk as well. So you can sit, sit at the desk to do your work or you can stand as well. And as I mentioned, there's um, up to two 27 inch large screen monitors inside. And you can use two, uh, and sorry, and two researchers can use the safe pod at, at any one time. There's also a locker on the outside where you can store your personal possessions. And there's a telephone inside where you can contact um, the data center that you're accessing data from or, 
or at the local SafePod coordinator. So the, one of the real benefits of SafePod is you, it provides access to many different data centers and data sets. So previously you may have had to travel to a, a particular safe setting to access um, one particular data set from a data center, but uh, uh, the, the benefit of the SafePod here is that you can connect to multiple different data centers from the same SafePod providing you, you have an approved project. So, so far, data centers that have joined the SafePod network are the UK data service providing access to their secure lab data, uh, the Office for National Statistics Secure Research Service, SAIL Data Bank, all ADR UK linked data set programs, and more recently, the Scottish Government. And we're also working with other data centers to join the network as well. So it will, it will continue to grow over time. So the major advantage for data centers is that because all safe pods are standardized, they're the same, then by accrediting one um, safe pod, um, it accredits all safe pods in the network across the UK. So it makes things very simple for them to have a ready-made solution for remote access to their data. Just say safe pods have been approved by the UK Statistical Authority as an access point for ONS, UKDS and SAIL data sets because they're um, uh, accredited processes under the Digital Economy Act. So just to recap, uh, major benefits of SAFEPOD for researchers are is local access to data, it's low cost, you can have, uh, access multiple different data centers from the same SAFEPOD. It should hopefully encourage research applications and help to uh, researchers to do more research. It's a comfortable dedicated environment to work in and two researchers can use the same SAFEPOD at any one time. So we have 18 safe pods live uh, available for booking across the UK at the moment. This is from a program of 24 safe pods and all these are expected to be ready by the end of March, 2023. And you can find more information about these on our website. Uh, it's at www.safepodnetwork.ac.uk. This is just a quick summary of where all the safe pods are. As you can see, the majority of them are in England, but we have one in Northern Ireland at Ulster University. And we have two in Scotland at the moment at Glasgow Caledonian and the University of Dundee. And we're installing in Inverness and Aberdeen as well. So there'd be four in total. Okay, so I just want to share how, um, how the process works really. So um, this is just a quick diagram. So here, there, there always must be a, an approved project in place between a, a researcher and data center. Then the researcher needs to join the SafePod network, which I'll go on to in a bit more detail, and the data center needs to join as well. Once that's happened, then the researcher can book the SafePod and the request goes to the data center. They'll review it, and if everything's okay, they'll set the access conditions, and the researcher can go ahead and, and use the SafePod. Uh, we would have already set up how the data provision uh, will, will work, and there's a local SafePod coordinator team that will then help the researcher to manage and use the SafePod. So just to follow on a little bit about the SafePod coordinators. So they're responsible for the security and operation um, of their SafePod. Every coordinator is background checked and they're also trained in our, in our policies and procedures. And they'll also provide the management of the SafePod booking um, and assist the researcher when when needed, when they arrive to, to use their safe pod. They're on call from the, from the safe pod via the, um, the telephone. And we currently have over 130 safe pod coordinators across the UK. So we also have a website. This is our public point, um, which provides information about the, about the network. And it's where researchers can register and they can make safe pod bookings. It's where SafePod coordinators can manage their SafePod and submit reports. And it provides a SafePod network about statistics of, of use of SafePods as well. So registering as a researcher is really simple. Um, you need to read through our user agreement, which details the policies uh, for SafePod use. And this is available to download from our website. Once you've done that, all you do is you complete a simple uh, online form. Please make sure that you register with work or academic email address. 
and then you'll be uh, emailed your, your login details. And then all you need to do is complete an online training course, which is based on our user agreement. You need to score 21 out of 24 to pass. And then once passed, you can go ahead and book safe pods. You'll need to take the training course every, every three years. Making the safe pod booking. Okay, so this is relatively straightforward as well. You just click the, uh, the book a safe pod button on the homepage of the website. And it'll bring up a map of locations. Um, you just select the safe pod that you want to use. Here I've selected the University of Bristol and it provides a bit of information and picture um, and also some summary information ab about the safe pod, such as who the main public point of contact is and how you, how you get to the, the safe pod as well and all, other things such as their opening hours. Next step, you just select the data center that you want to use. And it brings up a calendar. So you can select morning, afternoon, or all day normally. Um, and all you do is just click on the one you want. You can have up to, I think, 15 different slots that you can book. You're not restricted to one. So you just select, select the ones that you want. Once you've done this, all you need to do is just fill in a, a quick form just to provide a bit more information about your project, whether there'll be a second researcher that will be attending with you. And if data centers allow it, you can make requests to take things such as books or laptops into the, into the safe pod with you to assist with your, your research. And it's also a box there to, um, to provide any information about accessibility requirements too. Okay, once that's done, then your request is sent off to the, your, your chosen data center and they should respond to you within three working days. Once that's done, then um, you'll receive a booking confirmation email and a copy of that is also sent to the, uh, the local safe pod um, coordinator. Um, the, the booking confirmation will detail um, all the access conditions of use for the safe pod. So please just pay particular uh, attention to that as well. So on the day of the safe pod booking, just turn up, go to the location. You'll be met by a safe pod coordinator They'll carry out an identification check with you. So you need to bring along with you um, either a passport or driving license. And if you've not had, uh, if not used a safe pod before, then uh, the safe pod coordinator will, will carry out an induction with you just to show you how it should be used. And that's it. Once that's done, then you can uh, uh, access your, your data. Uh, hopefully you can see this screen. This is the main menu. Um, for, for the SafePod network when you go into the SafePod. And all you do is you just select the data center that you connect, want to connect with. So uh, once, you, once you do that, then it will boot into the data center's IT platform. And from there, all you do is you enter your project credentials that the data center would have provided with you. And then you can get on and do your research and analysis. Just to say as well, we also have an uh, application procedure for urgent or critical research, and that will enable you to have long or continuous use of a safe pod. So you just apply to us with details of your project, and then we'll get back to you, advise you of the outcome, and then help you set up your, your bookings for the safe pod for the period that you need it. This is the, the researcher menu. Uh, when you log into the safe pod network website, you can view or cancel your safe pod bookings here. And there's some also other handy uh, menu options um, as well to view safe pod contact information and, and review safe pod network documents. Just a little bit about our security procedures. So um, we have four security pr principles. So we have safe researcher. So as I've said, uh, researcher needs to abide by our user agreement and pass our training course. We have safe access, that's the local coordinator team that manages the operation and security of their safe pod. The safe data, uh, and that's a hardened IT system within the, uh, within the safe pod that provides remote access out uh, to the different data centers. And then we have safe analysis. So that's the safe pod, the physical structure, the camera, uh, and the door control uh, uh, access system as well. And these principles are surrounded by our, our standard set of policies and procedures that apply to all safe pods in the network. And finally, just to give you a, a heads up, 
um, as we're coming to the end of our installation program for safe pods um, we're hoping to also launch a new system called safe point which is a standardized system to support secure <coughs> excuse me data access from an approved room the main advantage of this is low cost um, and, it, and it's scalable as well so we're hoping to launch a call for this um, in 2023 um, so if you'd like to receive information on that, please um, join our mailing list. Um, details are on our website. Um, and that's it. There's my contact information. Um, any questions, you can either um, uh, do them. Sasha, I don't know whether you want to leave any questions to the end, or you can just email me um, here at uh, 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 the email address listed. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Sasha. And I think today we have we will be starting with Chris from the University of Bath. So I will start sharing the screen and put it into presentation mode. Can everyone see the screen? OK, yes. great. Thank you. And Chris, over to you. OK, thank you very much, Kate. Uh, and thanks for the invite. <laughs> it's my pleasure really to attend uh, this event today. Uh, so, uh, little things about me very quickly and my project. So, um, I'm a lecturer I'm based at the University of Bath in business economics, and we've been working the last uh, three years on a project. Uh, it's a joint collaboration with Innovate UK. So, that's the organization that funds uh, R&D uh, across the country. And uh, for the purpose of the project, we wanted to access some ONS data, some data from the Office for National Statistics. Uh, so we identified uh, those two uh, sources, and then we realized that we had to apply to obtain access to, to this data. Uh, it was very, very important for us uh, to get hold of this data, because otherwise we wouldn't be able to execute uh, our work. Um, so to this end, um, I applied personally to become an accredited researcher of the ONS. I remember I had to travel to Manchester to do this. So it was one day uh, training. And then on the next day and the following days, I had uh, I was reading a bit so that uh, I could uh, I could get my accreditation. I had to pass uh, an exam uh, test as well. Uh, I think. Uh, at the same time, I was also applying for the project. Um, so we had to document clearly how this project is going to benefit uh, the society. Um, and uh, as far as I remember, this bit, along with my application to the ONS, were the most time consuming elements of myself ac accessing actual data. And uh, finally, when everything was done uh i was going i remember to the uh facilities of the ons in london so i was traveling from bath uh, to the pimlico the south london and um it's north london actually but the south part of the north london uh it's very central and um and that was very very time consuming and also not the most cost effective option and uh, then obviously uh, the COVID arrived, so we had a, a very long pause in, in our projects because I couldn't travel uh, to London. And also, as far as I remember, the ONS facilities were closed for, for, for a lo very long time. And uh, when we decided to kickstart our projects, uh, a colleague told me, oh, why haven't you looked up, uh, you know, at, at the safe pods? I've never heard of this before at the time. Uh, and uh, yeah, I just had a look online and I realized that yes, maybe that's the way forward really to cut down A, on expenses and B, on travel times, because as I said, I was based in Bath uh, and that would possibly speed up the processes as it all happened indeed. Um, so again, I had to apply now for the third time uh, for the safe put. And I must admit that this application and um, the subsequent uh, test was the shortest in time, okay, uh, compared to my ONS application or the project application. And uh, I've been very, very satisfied since really uh, by using the safe uh, This uh, The team in Bath was superb. Uh, Darren, who was coordinating everything was superb. I remember, for example, Darren calling me, uh, being very proactive when the ONS had not approved uh, my booking so he was calling me on the same day to let me know oh, you have to 
possibly nudge the ONS so that they can approve first because they have to approve first the data provider, and then uh, the um, the safe put uh, will approve uh, uh, afterwards. Um, yeah, so to change, um, anything to change really uh, about the safe pods, I was really, I'm a very critical person, I must admit, but I was really struggling to find something that I had to change to the safe pod because I feel that everything has been very well uh, thought of. Um, all the processes that are in place ensure that uh, data is indeed accessed in a very safe way, whereas at the same time, it maintains a very, uh, you know, uh, it, it doesn't expose. It doesn't. It doesn't put too much pressure on the research in the sense that uh, once you arrive at the safe pod, the you know you can very easily access the data. The data you just need to uh, document uh, to provide your document, your passport, uh, really, and uh, your booking, and that's it. You can immediately access the data, so it doesn't confine really your uh, research. If there was any anything minor that I would change, possibly, I've realized that in the warm months of, of the summer, uh, maybe the, it was a bit uh, too warm in the safe pods. I'm just talking about maybe four or five days that I've realized this, and I'm a very frequent user of the safe pod, so I've just felt this for five for a few days, really. So that would be just a minor thing, really. I understand that these things are unavoidable sometimes. And possibly one more thing that could change could be, uh, as, I, as, as I mentioned in my slides, an automation of the short notice bookings. That's possibly something that could, uh, could, could also improve. So what I mean by this is that um, if your booking is, um, if you book today and your booking is, uh, is meant to happen within the next three working days, it, it, it's not being approved automatically by the safe boat, but it's pending on, on the availability of the, uh, safe put people really um, so possibly that could be a bit more automated uh, uh, if uh, I don't know how but uh, yeah but personally it hasn't caused me any 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 problems this but if I had to mention something I'm just trying again out of those minor points that would be uh, one um, I think possibly I could pause here so that the other researchers can speak and then if you have any questions I'm very very uh, happy to, to answer any of these, if I can. Thank you very much, Chris. And okay. now um, I will get our new slide up for um, Chris as well. Yeah, it's, it's confusing. Everybody everybody associated with SafePod, certainly at Exeter, it seems to be called Chris too. So um, yeah, thanks. If you don't mind putting that slide up, that'd be great. Absolutely. Um, Share screen. Yeah, super. Um, yeah, thanks very much, everybody. So, yeah, good afternoon. Um, uh, I'm Chris Playford. I'm a lecturer at the University of Exeter. Um, just to give you a little bit of context, I have a background in working with administrative data, um, both in my current job and in my previous job when I was at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, and in particular, I, I was uh, involved in working in secure settings, such as I worked with the Scottish Longitudinal Study, where I had to go to um, a safe setting, which was in Castorf in, in Edinburgh, which is um, Ladywell House uh, uh, for the National Records of Scotland. And also um, in the Scottish Centre for Administrative Data Research, I also did some work looking at, um, looked after children using linked administrative data there. So. Um, one of the things I hope to give you just very briefly today is a, a short comparison of the safe pod as opposed to visiting these data centers. And I think um, uh, Chris has given a really good illustration of that from having to travel to London. So um, I think really in terms of my own experiences, I then have then used the, the safe pod at Exeter very briefly, mostly in a testing capacity. And what I would say is that really it's, extremely comparable it, it works in fact it's it's simpler i would say because um the the process is is more straightforward and there's relatively few steps to go through i, I would hasten to add that also i think everybody who works with administrative data knows that the actual process of applying for a project i.e all the work that goes into specifying what you're going to do is actually where the real kind of 
time is spent in terms of getting access. So that's something to be mindful of if you've not if you're not particularly familiar with this area is get started early in terms of your projects and working on that, because actually, I think the safe pods have done a really great job of the, the last part uh, in terms of actually you physically sitting and doing some analysis. So, um, yeah, in terms of my experience, I, I have worked a lot with a UK data service, um, uh, secure lab uh, data, and I can say that um, my experiences of that in the safe pod and also through a connection outside of the safe pod, that the safe pod was incredibly straightforward. It was really directly comparable. Um, my advice to you really, in terms of working in these, these different kind of environments would be, um, would be to think about your kind of working pattern. Because when you're going into a room with conditions applied to it, where you have, you have a, a locked down environment to do a piece of analysis, this can often be really quite different from the kind of experiences you may have had where you just quickly Google something or you just quickly look something up. And as a working pattern, I think one of the experiences I had was that you, you, you think about what you're doing quite a lot more in terms of planning it before you get into the safe pod. And I think as you get kind of more experienced to this, you realize you kind of go into the safe pod a bit like kind of like going to the supermarket. You kind of, but you've got to have a shopping list before you go. You've got to think it through. Um, and you might find that actually in terms of the process that you, you spend concentrated pieces, periods working in the safe pod, doing your analysis and preparing your data, but you'll need to take some time outside the safe pod to actually then return to what your overarching question is and then to kind of like look up things. So, yeah, I think, um, yeah, I think um, very similar to Chris, I think um, working in safe settings as a whole is fine, but it does take a little bit of getting used to to start with. And um, one of the things I found in my own experience is also um, it does really pay dividends to kind of write yourself a research plan uh, that you've got before you go in there. And also to think about what resources are available to you within a secure environment. So for example, um, in the UK data service uh, secure lab, there's lots of geographical reference information already provided. Sometimes you might think you'll need to import it, but actually there's lots of information that you can use in terms of lookup information and job geographical information. So yeah, I'm happy, I'm happy to take any questions on these, these kinds of experiences. Um, uh, yeah, in terms of in terms of the safe pods, I would, you know, it's a big thumbs up from me, uh, particularly as I know we're down in Exeter, we're quite relatively far flung from a lot of other um, uh, big cities and universities. So I think it's going to be a re real help for people in terms of uh, getting access to these data directly. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. And I think those are the ends of our slides.